SpaceX under the CRS-2 contract with NASA, and it will carry with it valuable cargo, supplies, and scientific experiments up to the International Space Station to be unpacked by the Expedition 64 crew. I have with me today several subject matter experts who are eager to talk to you about this mission. First, we are joined by Kenny Todd, Deputy Program Manager for the International Space Station Program. Kurt Costello, Chief Scientist for the International Space Station Program. Sarah Walker, Director of the Dragon Mission Management at SpaceX. And Melody Levin, Launch and Weather Officer for the 45th Space Wing, U.S. Space Force. They look forward to answering your questions, but first we're going to give them each a moment for opening remarks. And uh, Kenny, we'll start with you. Thank you, Jasmine, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, um, hope everybody's doing well. I wish we were all in the same room, but but hopefully uh, hopefully soon. So again, hope everybody's doing well. Uh, I, I think I can speak for everybody up here. It says we're all pretty excited about about this SpaceX 21 mission, but I can guarantee you there's nobody more excited than the uh, the Increment 64 crew on orbit. Um, I. I kind of explain it to the to the increment team this we've got basically a a, stat, a set of dom, dominoes lined up now and and uh, our job through the next few months is to just knock them over one by one and uh, a couple of weeks ago we had that first domino fall with the uh, with the arrival of the uh, spacex crew dragon just a, a flawless mission uh, getting the the new crew to the space station so again congratulations to all of our our spacex friends uh, it was a very 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 well done mission and, and we're excited to to be at this point where we have five USOS crew on board. It's the, the first time we've had a long duration crew of this size. So um, everybody's doing well on orbit. The crew is, is integrated uh, extremely well and, and uh, functioning at, a, at what, I, what we would all consider a very, very high pace at this point. So uh, very excited to, to be at this point uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the program where we're, we're up to seven crew on the, on the International Space Station. Uh, that next domino in line is exactly uh, what we're here to talk about today, which is the SpaceX 21 mission. Um, as Jasmine mentioned, it's the first flight uh, for the second commercial resupply contract. So, again, just nice to get underway with that contract. There's there's nine flights that we've we've contracted with for for SpaceX to bring the to bring this new cargo dragon, and so uh, let's get on with it. And so that's what we're we're doing with this particular mission. Um, in addition to that, it's the first time we'll have a couple of dragons on board. We have a crew dragon. We'll have a cargo dragon. So again, uh, dragons everywhere you look. It'll be uh, it'll be a lot of fun. So. Um, this particular dragon is going to bring about 2,000 kilograms of research with it, uh, which, um, if you know Kate Rubens, it's uh, this is the ultimate Christmas present for Kate. Uh, she, uh, uh, I think, the one challenge we're going to have is probably trying to get her to uh, let everybody else play with the new toys when they get on orbit. So we'll see, we'll see how that goes. But uh, anyway, I know there's a lot of excitement on board, and and we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll look forward to getting that mission going here pretty quick. Once we get the Dragon on board, it'll be on somewhere around 35 days. Uh, you can look for, if we get off this weekend, somewhere around the 10th of January, give or take a day. Uh, we'll we'll uh, firm that up once once we get the Dragon on board. But again, looking at about a 35-day mission to get all the critical science done that, that needs to be done for, for, uh, for this flight. Um, in addition to uh, the 2,000 kilograms of, of research on board, uh, we're also bringing up a pretty significant new capability. It's uh, the first uh, commercial uh, airlock being brought to the International Space Station built by, by Nanorax. Um, it's going to be, a, again, a much needed uh, boost to, to our capability on, on orbit for, uh, for our deployables business uh, over, the, over the course of, of the program. Uh, we, we've seen this, this number of, of, of deployments uh, off of Space Station continue to go up. We've been using the Japanese airlock to do that for a, a number of years, and, and what we've seen is that the demand is just continuing to grow. And so, uh, again, um, this is uh, Nanorack saying, uh, you know, we, we can bring a commercial capability to do that to Station, uh, partnering with the airlock uh, on the Japanese segment as well, and so that will help us be able to, to continue to meet the need of all of our customers when it comes to deploying small satellites and and other items uh, that uh, that that we want to want to get off station so anyway we're excited about that very happy they're they're coming on board once uh, once we get done with this mission uh, after the 35 days uh, we'll we'll uh, go into another period another phase another domino if you will uh, where we're going to be looking at a string of EVAs uh, it's going to be somewhere between two and four 
uh, that we've we've uh, we've been considering. We will uh, we will try to try to make that uh, you know decision once we once we see exactly how much time we have uh, once space the, the SpaceX Dragon leaves, and ahead of what uh, what will be the next uh, cargo vehicle coming, which will be a, a, a Northrop Grumman Cygnus module NG15. We refer to it as. It'll arrive somewhere around the middle of February, middle to the end of February time frame. So we should have a window in there where we'll get some EVAs done. Uh, we got a good EVA crew on orbit to to make that happen. So uh, again, we'll uh, we got that queued up as well. Once we get into the NG15 time frame, uh, that'll keep the crew busy uh, up until um, you know the 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 middle to end of March time frame. And at that point, then we really are bearing down on the end of end of the increment. Uh, we'll be doing a lot of uh, final planning for the return of uh, Kate Rubens and her crewmates uh, on the Soyuz, and then immediately on the heels of that, we will we will look to uh, to bring Crew One uh, crew back uh, back down. So again, I, I see the next uh, the next few uh, months as as being a, a bit of a sprint, um, but uh, in there again, this crew is very excited, and again, they're a highly functioning uh, group on orbit. And so anyway, we're gonna we're gonna feed them as much as they want. So. Um, with regard to uh, the next few days, from a SpaceX 21 standpoint, we, we've got three opportunities. We're going to try tomorrow, Sunday, and again on Tuesday. Um, that'll be uh, basically the front end of this window. Once we get to the 8th, if we haven't launched, uh, we'll in enter into a period which we refer to as a high beta period where uh, from an on-orbit on perspective, it's just it's not a good, uh, when you look at the angle of the sun on station, um, there's a, it puts us in a situation where we have challenges to, uh, to keep all the right systems powered and keep things thermally conditioned when the sun's doing that to us. And so uh, it's best uh, to allow us to focus on managing through those time frames and not be dealing with visiting vehicles. So, so that's just kind of a ground rule that we just don't do, don't do vehicle traffic in that time frame. So uh, we'll, we'll stand down for about 10 days from December 10th to the 20th. And then we'll pick back up if we haven't gotten off the ground by the 8th. Uh, we'll pick back up on the 21st in that time frame and, and start to start trying to get the drag into station. So uh, that's the that's the near term plan that we're looking at from a from a SpaceX SpaceX launch standpoint and and how it uh, integrates with the program on orbit. With regard to overall ISS readiness, this morning we did a, a mission management team uh, meeting with all the all the different uh, players, our SpaceX. Uh, teammates as well as all the other uh, teams that, uh, that that make station go day in and day out. We had a unanimous go for this uh, launch and docking and so uh, we're excited to get on with it. We'll, uh, we'll see how things play out over the next couple of days but uh, hopefully by the middle of the week we'll have a dragon on the way to us if not already attached to us. So with that I'll hand it over to Kirk. Thanks Kenny. Tomorrow is a great day for ISS science. Uh, the ISS is receiving its, its first SpaceX upgraded Cargo 2 vehicle, uh, which brings it with it several new capabilities to enhance the capability of doing science on board. It increases the number of powered lockers available for upmass from 6 to 12, so doubles that capability. It adds with it the capability to support payloads while it's on orbit. So we will have four lockers of payloads. Uh, these are our cold stowage. Uh, units on board and operating throughout the mission. And it also increases our capability for rapid return of samples based on where it lands in the Atlantic and the capability of the helicopter off the return vehicle. We're able to return samples both within the, the landing plus four hour time frame and the landing plus nine hour time frame, which is a really critical capability for biological payloads which will be flying. flying. The, the SpaceX Dragon cargo missions are always great for adding science we can do on ISS, especially when it comes to the life sciences. And this mission is a real heavyweight when it comes to that. If I had to describe this mission in my own words, it might be cells, tissues, and organoids, oh my. While the launch is set for tomorrow, the whole process of getting science ready is really more than a full-time job. And this year, the COVID-19 pandemic has made that even tougher. So as most of us are just coming off a holiday break and getting ready for the next one, let's take a behind-the-scenes look at how some of our researchers have been working here at KSC and across the nation to get their science ready to go on this mission. Let's go ahead and roll the video.
Thanks for that. As you can see, there's a lot of science being prepped and getting ready to be launched tomorrow. And we'll talk about those investigations in just a moment. If that whets your appetite and you're interested in more about how we get science ready to fly on the ISS, I encourage you to Google uh, NASA Explorers series on uh, Google and look for season four, which tracks some of our researchers through an entire deployment of their science on board the ISS. Okay, so on to the science. In the order that you saw them in the video, we'll talk about these investigations coming up on SpaceX 21. The first is the HemoQ investigation, which is a new technology that will allow us to do white blood cell counts on orbit for all the different uh, types of white blood cells. This allows the user to understand if the, uh, the human immune system is reacting to an infection, uh, be it bacterial, viral, or otherwise. The goal of this investigation is to validate the microfluidic design of this payload and ensure that it can operate in a microgravity environment. The hope is that someday we'll be able to use this in our extended duration missions to help us ensure our astronauts' health. The next investigation up in the video was Micro 14. And this investigation uh, focuses on the growth of an, in microgravity of an opportunistic pathogen, the yeast C. albicans. Uh, this yeast is being looked at to evaluate how it responds, how the genetic re, uh, expression changes in exposure to microgravity, and to understand how that yeast's virulence changes on orbit. This will help us understand that process on the ground from a fundamental biological perspective. Uh, also in the video was bacterial adhesion and corrosion. In this investigation, uh, sponsored by Boeing, they'll be using test patches of common aerospace materials placed in the cabin and then touched by our crew members. Half the patches are covered in an antimicrobial uh, coating and after six months, the patches will be returned and analyzed on the ground to understand how those uh, bi bacterial populations have changed and whether the antimicrobial coating is uh, good for keeping surfaces clean on the interior of spacecraft. Uh, the next investigation is one of the uh, physical science investigations that we have, and that's the subs of brains investigation. It stands for brazing in space. And this uh, investigation is looking at the process of brazing, which is joining metal alloys, uh, not through welding, but through brazing, which melts just the joining material and not the underlying base layer. So this allows us to look at a process for joining materials in space that doesn't have to use as high a temperature melting points as welding or sintering on orbit. We'll be looking at uh, the process within the microgravity science glove box and trying to understand the strength of those welds and whether or not uh, it's suitable for future use. The next investigation you saw is our major external payload going up this time, the Nanorax Bishop airlock. And this airlock is great for science in, uh, in two ways. One, it allows us to directly deploy bigger payloads than we've been able to before in terms of small satellites and cube satellites. Uh, the airlock volume is about five times that of our GEM airlock, which we typically perform most of those actions through now. And then additionally, as uh, you might have heard earlier today, it allows us to dispose of trash. So uh, some trash can be placed in the airlock and then uh, released into space. And this, again, allows us to accommodate more payloads, scientific payloads, on orbit when we launch. Uh, the Bishop airlock also has capabilities to host internal and external payloads, and those will be uh, through the commercial developer Nanorex. The next investigation was the Cardinal Heart investigation, where a team of researchers from Stanford University is looking at how engineered heart tissue responds in space. This is a group of uh, cardiomyocytes, endothelial cells, and cardiac fibroblasts all joined together into a tissue. They'll be performing an analysis, a genetic analysis, to determine the gene expression from each of these heart tissues and comparing that to samples on the ground. What we hope to understand from this investigation is the differences between 
cardiac dysfunction that we might see uh, due to microgravity stressors and that that we see on Earth both in healthy and disease state tissue. We'll be trying to understand that because in space, it's good to know whether our astronauts' health could be compromised by e extended duration exposure to microgravity. In, this is the first in a line of investigations. The next line will study some therapeutics uh, for heart disease that could be tested in a microgravity environment. The next investigation was MVP Cello 6, and this one is uh, a tissue chip investigation growing tissues of knee cartilage and synovium fluid. Uh, particularly, this investigation is looking at the disease post-traumatic osteoarthritis. And these samples were taken from donor human samples uh, on the ground and being flown into space. We study tissues and organoids in space because they tend to grow more 3D-like structure. And better 3D-like structure in a tissue or organoid model can give us a better understanding of what's going on in the biology of that system. So we're looking at these uh, uh, samples and we're going to see if there is a disease state present in these samples and then how they recover over time uh, based on exposure to therapeutics. Hopefully this someday will lead to better therapies for uh, groundbound patients with, with this disease. The last investigation was brain organoids. Organoids are small living masses of cells that interact and grow, and these are uh, formed of neurons and other brain tissue. Uh, the organoids were prepared on the ground and being flown to space. They are developed enough to where they respond to sensory and stress stimuli. So the investigation's goal is to understand how uh, basic biological factors impact uh, neuronal behavior in, in, the, in these organoids. These are just a few of the investigations, but as you can see, there are a ton of biological investigations going on board. We also have investigations from our international partners. Uh, JAXA is uh, flying space organogenesis, again looking at the development of tissues in uh, various different uh, stages uh, being developed on orbit, and the ESA uh, the European Space Agency is flying an investigation looking at biomining asteroids, so using biological microbes to obtain uh, useful sample or useful materials from asteroid samples, uh, looking at extracting magnesium and iron from those. This may be something that we use in future exploration someday to help us gain in, in situ resources. If you want to learn anything more about the payloads going up to ISS, please go to nasa.gov slash ISS-science, and you can see details on all of the payloads that we've talked about today. Thank you. Sarah, over to you. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, well, again, my name is Sarah Walker. I'm the Director of Mission Management, uh, Dragon Mission Management here at SpaceX, and I'm thrilled to be here today. We're very excited about the launch this weekend of our newest, our, our upgraded version of our Cargo Dragon spacecraft. Our first opportunity, as uh, Kenny mentioned, is tomorrow at 11.40 a.m. Uh, off of Launch Complex 39A, and then that booster will turn around and land on our, of course, I Still Love You drone ship, uh, just a little bit out to sea. Fun trivia fact for you. Um, if we do, uh, if we are able to launch tomorrow, if the weather holds, then uh, this will be the third year in a row where we launch a NASA CRS mission on 12-5. So, Melody, we're crossing our fingers. Uh, she'll give us an update on the weather in a minute. Um, if need be, we do have a backup available on 12-6. It's about 20 minutes earlier in the day, 11-17 Eastern Time is that backup opportunity. Um, this is actually the fourth flight of this particular booster. It, the, it first flew on another NASA mission, the Demo-2 mission, earlier this year, and uh, then a commercial mission and a Starlink mission, and here we are uh, uh, on its fourth flight. It's vertical in the pad right now, and the SpaceX crew is loading the last of the NASA time-critical science on board through the crew access arm there at the top of the tower on LC-39A, so that operation is underway. Uh, I think I have a picture for you. Uh, this is a, a, oh, it's a beautiful vehicle. 
Um, that's the first first flight here of our Cargo Dragon upgraded Cargo Dragon uh, out at the pad. I think that was taken a few nights ago when it went vertical right before our successful static fire test uh, just a couple days ago earlier this week. Um, it's been a really exciting year for the Dragon program. Uh, 2020 has been a hard year in a lot of ways around the world, um, but in the midst of that, we've actually experienced a lot of really critical milestones, and we've been really honored and blessed to be a part of uh, all the successes that we've seen with the Dragon program. You may remember back in January, we had our in-flight abort test for the crew program. So that was when the rocket, uh, if, if anything were to happen with the rocket in flight, we demonstrated that our spacecraft is able in that scenario to separate itself safely from the rocket and parachute the crew back to safety. So really important flight test there. Then in April, we had the Cirrus 20 mission. So that was another cargo resupply mission and the last flight of our Dragon, our fir uh, first version of Dragon. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the first flight of our next upgraded version of Dragon. Then the next month in May, uh, we flew the Demo 2 mission. So that was uh, the first mission with crew on board. Bob Binkin and Doug Hurley went up to the International Space Station. It returned human spaceflight to U.S. soil for the first time in nearly a decade. And so incredibly monumental moment for us. And uh, they stayed up there for a month or two and then came back later in the summer. And that brings us to a couple weeks ago when we launched uh, the Crew-1 mission, which had another four astronauts that went up to the space station. And they're up there now eagerly awaiting this um, a uh, huge shipment of science that we're uh, setting up to them this weekend. Uh, I think Kenny also noted that when this dragon arrives, it'll be the first time that there are two dragons on the space station simultaneously. And it really ushers in a season of continuous dragon presence for the near future, uh, at least through the end of 2021. And so we're excited about all the missions that uh, will be flying for, the, for NASA and the International Space Station program, both cargo and crew. And it's really just an honor to be a part of that. So I have an, another picture for you here. This is the interior of this upgraded Cargo Dragon spacecraft. So the differences you'll see compared to what you might have seen a couple weeks ago with the Crew-1 launch where you would see seats and displays, touchscreens for the, the crew on board. This, this vehicle um, actually has an elaborate system of racks and straps to take a large amount of cargo uh, to and from the space station, uh, up to 6,400 kilograms uh, launching between our pressurized and unpressurized sections, and then uh, the capsule returns to Earth with uh, 4,400 pounds of cargo. So um, a, a really big vehicle, takes a lot of science up, a lot of upgrades over our previous Dragon, including 20% more volume and double, as Kurt mentioned, double the amount of powered cargo, which is really where a lot of that life science and time critical cargo goes up uh, in those lockers. It stays on station for up to 75 days, so that's about twice as long as our previous version. It's uh, certified for reuse um, up to five times versus uh, we, we flew our previous version. Several of those capsules flew three times, and so one more incremental step forward for reusability. And um, lastly, it splashes down in the Atlantic Ocean, which is a key enabler for us to uh, meet some of those strict tight um, science timelines that Kurt was mentioning. We are able to get science from splashdown into the hands of researchers at Kennedy Space Center within hours. And uh, so that's a, that's a huge advantage. Uh, it's also an advantage for SpaceX because we do perform maintenance on our vehicles to get them ready for the next flight here at Cape Canaveral and so uh, at our facilities there. So splashing down in the Atlantic allows us to get those vehicles back and start to work on them again uh, very quickly. The countdown for tomorrow's launch is pretty similar to past missions. We, we kick off about 35 minutes prior to launch with propellant load. Uh, you'll see drag, uh, Falcon progress through uh, its various milestones. And then once Dragon is in free flight, it will be in what we call phasing. Uh, which is basically catching up to the space station in free flight. Uh, it will be in that for about 24 hours. If we launch on the 5th, I think the phasing time is more like 27 and a half hours for the sixth opportunity, but it will spend about a day in free flight catching up to the space station and then arrive and dock the following day. It'll stay up there for just over a month, and uh, that, that time frame, frame is really driven by the specific science on board and, and how long NASA needs us up there for those experiments, and then uh, we'll bring them safely back to Earth. So. Uh, I want to conclude my, my remarks by just saying thanks to our NASA partners. You guys have been wonderful partners with us and uh, the 45th Space Wing, uh, all the SpaceX teammates who have uh, developed this vehicle and gotten us uh, here to launch day tomorrow. So thank you. All right, and we're going to go to uh, Melody Levin. 
Hi, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I wish I had a more or a simple or a simple way of explaining the weather pattern for tomorrow. Um, two words is complicated. Um, Essentially, the trend is starting to be our friend, though, so let's talk about it. We have a low pressure system that's developing across the central Gulf Coast. It is going to sweep through the deep south tomorrow, and with that, it's going to bring a cold front, and it, that cold front is going to slide down the Florida Peninsula tomorrow. Now, previously, uh, it looked like that cold front would be passing right during the launch window, but the trend is now our friend. The models are now bringing that cold front through prior to the launch window. Um, because of that, we're expecting most of the rain associated with the cold front to be pretty much done for before the launch window opens up. Um, one complicated scenario with the cold front moving through is just we're not exactly sure when the clouds are going to um, clear out of the way for us. Um, so we're hoping the, the earlier a cold, the cold front will pass, um, the more clearing we'll get. Um, so we did previously in the week have a probability of violation of 60%. We have dropped that to 50% today. And I'm hoping tomorrow, uh, when we're talking about the weather in the morning, we'll be able to drop that even far, for, further. Um, let's go to the weather slide. And uh, you can see 50%. Um, um, the main concerns for tomorrow are the cumulus cloud rule and the thick cloud layer rule. Um, one thing to note uh, for the recovery uh, of the booster, that area is currently in a gale warning, um, and that is due to the location of the low pressure center. Um, but we're hoping that we will be able to uh, clear out that warning or at least improve the conditions uh, for the area. Um, and that's really going to be dependent on uh, that low pressure moving out of the way. Um, so let's talk about Sunday's weather. Sunday, uh, that frontal boundary should be uh, positioned across extreme southern Florida. Um, so we're really not expecting any, uh, w anything in the way of showers or thunderstorms for Sunday. We do have weak high pressure in the area. Um, one complication with Sunday, though, is uh, there is going to be another forming low pressure center, this time in the western and central portion of the Gulf of Mexico. That low pressure center, even though it's not going to be uh, giving us any rain, um, it's likely going to be producing a mid-level cloud shield, and that will be basically moving across the entire state of Florida on Sunday. Um, and we don't really like mid-level clouds for our weather rules because they tend to be above the freezing level and that uh, sometimes or often uh, makes things, makes the clouds electrified, which is a big no-no for uh, the rocket and for um, our launch weather criteria. So let's go ahead and look at the forecast for Sunday. Um, right now we're seeing a 30 percent um, chance of uh, probability of violation, which is a 70 percent uh, go for Sunday's weather. This, I do want to mention, has crept up, though. We previously had 20 percent, so today we bumped that up to 30 percent just due to the fact that the low pressure center is likely going to form. Um, once again, our main concerns are going to be the thick cloud layer rule and the cumulus cloud rule as well. Um, but one thing to note, though, the recovery weather should be much improved for an, a launch attempt on Sunday. Um, but we're, of course, going to give it our best try to go um, tomorrow, and I'll do what I can to, <laughs> to try to improve that weather for you, Sarah. Um, so that's it for me. Enjoy the launch. All right, thank you all so much for those opening remarks. Uh, we know that you've done a lot of work to get up to this point, and we have people who are watching who want to know even more about this mission. So uh, we're going to open up the lines for questions. Um, and for those of you watching at home, please remember that you can join in the conversation uh, on social media using hashtag AskNASA. Uh, so our first question from the line comes from Marsha Dunn with the Associated Press. Yes, hi. Um, I had a, a quick Dragon question and one other. Um, is this new enhanced cargo version of the Dragon, is it the same size more or less as the Crew Dragon? I'm just trying to picture how much bigger it really is. And for Kenny, um, I know that uh, Kate loves her science, but are there any more personal Christmas gifts going up for the crew? Thanks. 
Yes, thanks for your question, Marsha. Um, yes, so the crew and cargo Dragon, uh, the Dragon 2 here, uh, are the same size. What you see on the outside, the exterior is uh, really the same outer mold line. The vehicles are the same size. It's just the interior that's uh, traded out for the different use cases. Hey, Marcia, yeah, um, we were laughing earlier. I think I've, I've done all these press conferences right ho here before Christmas, and so I anticipate this question every year. So uh, thanks for thanks for holding steady uh, year over year. Thank you. Uh, yeah, in, in general, um, you know, the, the crew's going to at least get some food on orbit, uh, Christmassy kind of food, and uh, so I, I don't think that will be any surprise to them. But uh, Anything much more than that, and you know, just in general, I don't like to get out in front of Santa Claus because um, I, I fear it might mess up my own Christmas. And so, uh, so anyway, we'll just uh, let's see what happens when they open the hatch. But uh, uh, anyway, I'm, uh, I'm 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 optimistic. All right, thank you. Our next question comes from Irene Klotz with Aviation Week. Thanks very much. I have uh, two quick questions. The first is, is booster recovery now part of the launch commit criteria? Uh, no, it is not. Um, the launch crime, uh, comment criteria um, is a specific range rule. Um, so that's not included in the uh, percentage of probability of violation. Um, but to talk more about that, I can pass that over to you, Sarah. Sure, yeah, it's definitely something we watch closely going into the count here. So uh, it is important to us to recover these boosters uh, and use them again. And so uh, we do watch the weather closely. Yeah, and Irene, um from a NASA perspective, uh, you know, we, we work jointly with, with the SpaceX team to to build that set of, of launch commit criteria uh, for every launch. And and the reality is that, that these boosters are just as important to, to us as they are to SpaceX. It's important. Uh, uh, we know that they have a, a, a model that they use in terms of, of trying to fly the flights, uh, not just NASA flights, but all the other flights. And it, these boosters um, on a case by case are, are very important to us and very important to NASA. So uh, that's, a, that's a, uh, an ongoing dialogue that happens on every flight where we sit down and, and look at the, the needs for those boosters, uh, what the follow on requirements are and uh, what it means to SpaceX, what it means to NASA. And so, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's an ongoing dialogue for every flight. And our next question is from Stephen Clark with Space Flight Now. Hi, Stephen Clark for Space Flight Now. Two questions uh, from me as well. First, uh, could maybe Sarah confirm the exact launch time tomorrow with uh, seconds, if possible? And uh, also going forward on these future uh, uh, Dragon 2 cargo missions, um, is the plan to fly all of these missions off of 39, 39A given the Ability, ability to do late load cargo on the crew access arm, or uh, is there some flexibility to fly these missions off of Pad 40 um, going forward as well? Thank you. Yes, thanks for your question. So uh, to the second, our opportunity tomorrow is at 11.40 and 19 seconds Eastern time. Uh, the backup opportunity is 11.17 and 44 seconds. And yes, we are uh, designed to go out of LC-39A for uh, these, these upgraded cargo Dragon flights. And that is a huge advantage to us to be able to perform late load cargo while the vehicle's already vertical, um, allows us to do it even closer to T0. So yes, we are designed to go out of LC-39A. All righty, and our next question is coming from social media. Uh, we have a question from Twitter asking, what are the new features added on the upgraded Dragon cargo spacecraft? Sure, so uh, I, I mentioned a couple of them. It's, it's bigger on the inside than our previous cargo Dragon. Uh, it can hold about 20% more cargo. It uh, holds a lot more powered lockers, which uh, enables some of that uh, life science and time critical cargo. Um, it's designed to be up in space uh, on the space station about twice as long. And uh, let's see, it, it can be reflown more times. Each capsule can be reflown uh, up to five times. And uh, it also splashes down at the Atlantic instead of the Pacific, which gives us um, a lot of flexibility to do some really rapid return of science for NASA, uh, for the scientists there at KSC, as well as um, it enables us to get our vehicles back to start performing maintenance on them for their next flight. So lots of uh, key advantages on this upgraded version of Dragon. And Sarah? That ability to get science back quickly is so important for biology, space biology, because we want to understand whether the effects that we're trying to measure on orbit 
are, are due to the microgravity condition or due to the stress that uh, a, a participant might or a sample might see on landing. So having those returned to the Cape really quickly and handed over to our scientists is, is a great new capability. Thanks. Thanks. All right, thank you so much for that. Uh, our next question on the line comes from uh, Ken Kramer with Space Up Close. Uh, hi, thank you. Thanks for taking my question, and hopefully we'll have good luck with the weather. Um, my question is about uh, the abort modes to orbit. I'm wondering uh, what are the capabilities, if any, of the um, of the Cargo Dragon? You don't have any Super Dracos there, and there was there was a flight CRS seven. The the payload didn't make it to orbit because it couldn't abort, and so the cargo could not be saved. So, what are the possibilities here? Thank you. Sure. Thanks for your question. Yeah. So that abort capability is is really an upgrade specific to our Crew Dragon for uh, crew, crew missions, and so um, that capability is not available on the on the Cargo Dragon spacecraft. But um, it represents a huge step forward for manned spaceflight in general. Uh, to be able to provide that launch abort capability to our astronauts from uh, T0 all the way through uh, getting them safely to orbit. Wonderful. All right. Our next question is from uh, Camden Hall from Nashville News. Yeah, thanks for taking my question. I was wondering, with the launch tomorrow, uh, will there be more burns uh, that will occur in orbit to dock with the International Space Station, or will be, or will Will there be any burns? Thanks. I couldn't hear the question. I'm sorry, could it be repeated? Can you repeat that question, please? Yes, thanks for taking my question. I was wondering, with the launch tomorrow, will there be a series of burns to dock with the ISS? And will there be more uh, on this cargo mission than there are, say, on crew missions? Oh, I see. Thank you for your question. Um, yes, there's definitely a series of burns. Uh, it's It's a something we call phasing, where um, Dragon is inserted into its injection orbit and then it performs a series of burns to raise altitude and, and speed up as it's kind of catching up with the space station that's also orbiting. All right, thank you so much for that. Uh, our next question is going to come from Mark Gotch uh, with Historical Aerospace News. Yes, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the very informative briefing. Could you tell me this? Uh, with the newly arrived Crew-1 astronauts, uh, looking at the duration of their stay at the ISS being as long as six months, will you be doing more extensive testing of uh, their cardiovascular systems, their muscles, et cetera? And looking at this, uh, I'm thinking going forward to the missions of Orion going to Mars in the future that are said to be that long in six months, uh, would you look and expect that your findings could uh, have a great effect on those missions of Orion in the future? Thanks for the question. Uh, our research continues to look at six-month increments. Our human research program has a number of studies that measure baseline uh, capabilities and functions of the human body over those six months. And as we did during the one-year mission uh, with uh, Scott Kelly, uh, we're also interested in looking at uh, future one-year missions and the capability to extend the duration of our studies and understand in that six month to one year to potentially longer missions, what are the impacts on our crew health. So uh, yes, we'll be adding to the uh, data we have on six month crew members and uh, in the future here looking to also additionally add one year crew members. All right, thank you. Uh, our last question is going to come from social media, uh, and it is for Mr. Todd. It says, uh, space station status question for Mr. Todd. Can you provide an update on the departure dates for the spacecraft currently docked slash berthed to the International Space Station, uh, both the Progress uh, spacecrafts and the Cygnus spacecraft? Thank you. Well, the Cygnus spacecraft um, uh, starting there first, that's the NG-14 that's on, on uh, Notable Nader. Uh, it uh, it will depart. Um, uh, its plan right now is depart around the 16th of December. That's something we're continuing to look at. Um, we have a a plan in place uh, right now. It's kind of a, what I'll call a backup plan in the event that we we uh, don't get off the ground on the 8th. 
um, we are uh, considering whether or not it makes sense to do um, a couple of EVAs uh, while we're in this high beta period. If we do that, we will probably take that Northrop Grumman um, departure, uh, that Cygnus module, and move it out to the right a little bit in order to open up a window for us to be able to to do the uh, to do the EVAs in there, uh, just because there's just too much in there to try to get EVAs done and and uh, get a, a vehicle prepped for departure as well. So, anyway, I, I'd say there's a bit of a question mark, but uh, in, in the event uh, we do get Dragon on board and and uh, we follow the the primary plan we have laid out, it's about the about the 16th of of December. As far as uh, the progress, there's a, a couple of progresses on right now. Um, the uh, the 75P, which is on the uh, aft. Um, part of the service module right now uh, will depart uh, somewhere in early early February, and uh, I apologize, 76P. I don't remember off the top of my head exactly when it's when it's going to depart, but I can get you that answer. Thank you so much for that, Kenny. Uh, we actually have another question on the line, uh, so we're going to go to Marsha Smith, Mitt Smith, excuse me, with uh, Space Policy Online. Uh, thanks. I had a question for Sarah. I'm curious, what is the largest item that you could fit inside Cargo Dragon in terms of the physical size and the mass? If you had just one object, how big could it be? Sure. So the size of the cargo is driven by uh, that docking adapter that's used uh, as a standard interface up on the space station, and we're designed to match it. Um, so it has to get through that, that forward hatch there. Um, the items are pretty big. I don't know the exact dimensions, but on the order of a couple hundred pounds and uh, relatively large. Uh, so, yes, I, we, we had a couple um, cargo items this mission that were within an inch or two of the, of the size of the hatch, so we can definitely uh, use our ground support equipment to uh, get very large items through that through that hole. All right. Thank you so much for that final question. Uh, that's going to conclude our coverage for this pre-launch news conference. I want to thank all of our panelists who joined us here today and uh, gave us a lot of information and excitement for CRS-21. Uh, this mission is targeted to launch tomorrow, which is Saturday, December 5th at 1140 a.m. And we hope that you'll join us again here on NASA TV for our pre-launch uh, coverage starting at 1115 a.m. Uh, you can watch that on NASA TV or NASA.gov slash live. Uh, we hope to see you again there, and we thank you so much for joining us today. Go SpaceX, go NASA, and go CRS-21.